Hello. <laughs> How's it going? Um, welcome back to my office. Um, today we're going to do something a little different than previous ones. We're not going to do anything too specific about AWS or Amazon Web Services or like a deep dive into blockchains like we did last week. Um, all that's going up on YouTube if anyone wants to rewatch the previous streams. Although I still have to glue together last week's because it ended up in two sessions. Because uh, I somehow closed the original one. I'll try to avoid that today. Um, but today uh, we're going to dive into um, two algorithms that I I think are super awesome. I've done uh, I don't know how many times I've whiteboarded these with teams, um, but every single time it's super interesting and and useful. Um, we're going to dive into uh, shuffling and how shuffling works and what, what's involved. And then very related, we're gonna dive into sampling and a kind of sampling called reservoir sampling, which is unbelievably underappreciated um, and an incredibly useful technique to know. I, I end up using it a lot. So we'll, we'll cover that too. But I, uh, I said on, on Twitter that I'd start with a little bonus, which is uh, earlier today I retweeted out um, a math problem that uh, Brilliant Org came up with it's um, you can uh, you can see it if you go to my 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 Twitter handle, but um, I have it here out on paper. I, we don't have color printers here at Amazon. We only have black and white printers, uh, so so I uh, we obviously can't afford color printers. So I um, so I decided to draw it out uh, on um, on my paper here. I actually these I I've been using a pad. I don't know if people have noticed, like an, a rip off notepad. It's kind of like gigantic post its, right? I can like rip out pages, but it's actually a dot grid as well. I don't know. If, yeah, I don't know if you can pick out the dots if the video resolution is good enough. Let me get it closer to the camera. Yeah, there we go. There's dots, so it's pretty easy for me to draw uh, like math diagrams and stuff like that on. But anyway, but the problem they posted was. Uh, Okay, so you got a you got a set of squares like this, right? Where you got a set of like recursive squares, right? And and um, how much area is shaded green, right? In the biggest square, that's the question. And they've got four options. You know, a fifth of the total area uh, is shaded green, or a quarter, or a third, or two fifths, right? Those are the options. And if anyone has a, a quick opinion or a take, put it in the chat. You know, if you want to go, what your guess is before we uh, <laughs> before we start getting at a few um, different ways to, to solve this. And, but um, what I found really interesting is that um, I think the way like a ten or eleven year old would solve this problem is the best way <laughs> and is the <laughs> easiest way um, and the most playful and the most fun way. And I'm gonna save that till the end but is not the way I saw literally anybody on Twitter solve this, <laughs> uh, which I just find super interesting. They all went to like geometric series and um, other, other ways to try to get at it. And so um, straight away, right, when you look at this problem, you can see why, okay, well, someone might jump to an answer like, well, a quarter, because a quarter of this square is, is um, is shaded and maybe a quarter of this smaller square is shaded and a quarter and so on and so they just kind of logically conclude a quarter without really thinking about it too much like you can forgive somebody for saying a quarter but it's obviously not a quarter because you know a quarter of this big square is shaded and a quarter of the next smaller square and a quarter of the next smaller square and so on so it's clearly a number that's like bigger than a quarter right so it's not a quarter that's pretty easy um, I you know, you can then see the intuition of like, well, it's not a quarter, so it's bigger than a quarter. Um, you know, five is bigger than four, <laughs> so so maybe it's a fifth, right? But you know, a fifth is, is smaller than a quarter, actually. So if you think about that a little more, it's definitely not a fifth, right? So that kind of leaves us with two reasonable answers, right? Well, it could be a third. Maybe all this adds up to being a third, or it could be it, it all adds up to being two fifths. And I think they're. Um, and I think those are both, you know, reasonable guesses if you don't want to put any more thinking into it. So it's a very mathematical way to solve this, right? Like we can we can start to work it out. I mean, go well. Okay, well, a quarter of, of the overall square is shaded green. Plus, 
Uh, this one, which is a sixteenth of the total, right? It's a quarter of a quarter. So that's a sixteenth plus one sixty-fourth is actually the next thing, you know? Uh, a quarter of a quarter of a quarter. Plus a quarter of a quarter of a quarter of a quarter, which is plus, you know, one two hundred and fifty-sixth, right? And you can, um, you know, you can go to a calculator and start to work this out, right? Like if we, if we go over here and try to code this out, um, so if I just use Python as my calculator and do like, so I'm just going to put in uh, 1 divided by 4.0 in Python so that I get um, decimals, otherwise it'll just give me zeros. Um, plus, you know, 1 over 16 plus 1 over uh, 64.0 plus 1 over 256.0 and so on, right? You can see, okay, wow, it's pretty close to a third. Right, and you can see how uh, if you add more numbers, you know maybe it's going to converge or or asymptote towards a third, and it looks looks very likely if you do the calculator thing that uh, a third is the answer, right? And a third is the answer, <laughs> and if you sit down and if you do the the sum, uh, I'll try to find somewhere to write it, which uh, you know would look like um, oh god, I can't draw for stuff. You know, um, so if you do the series of whatever it is, one over, um, we're right now here somewhere, um, n to the four plus one, I think it is. I don't want to get this wrong and mislead anybody. Um, man, I went to the trouble of pre computing this earlier, and then I lost it. Um, I think it's one over n uh, to the four. Or Four to the n plus one. There we go. That's what it would be. Um, if you work out that series, it will converge to a third, right? But you got to do, you got to do real sums, uh, and and uh, at that point you're into high school math, which seems too hard for this problem. Um, so there's a really really easy way to solve this, <laughs> which I didn't see anybody do, and I don't really know why, um, which is to solve it graphically, right? Which is totally fine. And it's kind of, you know, how we first learned to solve these problems, you know, there's, there's like graphical proofs of uh, Pythagoras' theorem and so on, which, you know, I learned when I was like 11 or 12. Um, and I think it's pretty common to learn in school. I, I, you know, I don't know how different school systems work. But, you know, the simplest way I, I see for this is, well, okay, for, forget about the square for a minute and just focus on this shape, right? Like I'm going to exclude the bottom square, right? So just focus on this shape. So clearly one third of this is green, right? There are three squares and one third of it is green, right? And then we're gonna recurse down. We're just gonna move diagonally. Same thing again, one third of this is green. And like one third of that is green. And all we're doing is re recursion, right? We're just moving the paper diagonally and blocking it out, right? And you can see no matter what you do, right? Every level you recurse, there's always gonna be a third that's green. Right? And you can graphically extend that as far as you want. It's always going to be a third that's green. And that's a valid way to you know, tackle a problem like this. And like I said, the way a 10 or 11 year old would probably try to and get to the answer uh, much, much faster. And I just find it fascinating like that the, the more we learn sometimes about math and the more like fancy techniques um, we learn, the, you know, the more we forget that there's like just really easy ways to come at some of this stuff sometimes. Um, separately, I had a Twitter conversation with um, Sophie Schmig earlier on Twitter today, and, and uh, if you're not following her, find her. She's awesome, but she's um, she's tweeting about the geometric axioms and how um, you know simple axioms like well, you can only draw one line between two points uh, are the foundation of a lot of mathematics, but you can just change that axiom and say well, more than one line can be drawn between two points, and then you've got a whole new kind of geometry and a whole new kind of math and and uh, and it's super interesting and she's lots of interesting observations on that and it gets a little into the philosophy of mathematics and so on but what I find so interesting about that is that you know we all learn when we're very young okay well you learn these axioms like there's only one way you know to draw uh, a line between between two points right or um, or we learn Pythagoras' theorem, right, which is based on some some other geometric axioms of, of things about um, things about triangles. 
But what I find really, really interesting is that those axioms, which we're taught to just accept as, well, they're so fundamental that you just kind of have to accept that they're true because those are going to be the foundations of mathematics, are in fact not true, <laughs> right? <laughs> like there's a, there's a famous saying that uh, I think uh, attributed to Box, a, a statistician, um, that you know all models are wrong, but some are useful. And that's as true for the models like lines and points and planes and triangles and right angles as it is any other kind of model. Uh, lines, points, planes, triangles, right angles, none of these exist in reality. And they are not a part of the physical, physical reality of nature, right? You cannot find a straight line in the, in the physical universe. Can't be done, right? You go deep enough, like, there's like quantum perturbations and fluctuations and nothing stays still. There's not even such a thing as a point, right? If you get deep into quantum physics, everything's just a probability model of where things are. There, are, you know, Pythagoras' theorem only works on a plane, but there's no such, there's no real thing like a plane. In reality, everything's slightly curved, right? Which I just find fascinating. That like the, the things that we accept as the being the most fundamentally true are actually built on, <laughs> you know, a bottom of lies. Uh, it's true in our imaginations, you know, and mathematics is a very imaginary field. Anyway, two things I thought were interesting. But we're going to, we're going to, what we're really here to cover is shuffling and sharding. <laughs> so let me get into that. So, uh, um, so I said in my intro that these are really, really, really useful algorithms. And um, I, uh, I often find myself needing to shuffle things. Um, of, uh, sometimes it's because I need to traverse things in a non-deterministic order, right? And, some, and sometimes that can be an important uh, security property, right? Like that I'm that I'm going about things in a non-predictable way that uh, an attacker or someone who's trying to interfere with it uh, couldn't predict. Um, and sometimes it's because uh, I'm trying to build fairness into a system and making sure nobody gets you know, too much priority over anybody else and so on. And shuffling en all often ends up being a really nice go-to technique, right? And uh, I think the first thing to know about shuffling, right, is if we have a list of elements, right? So I'm just going to say element A and B and C and D and so on, right? Shuffling is, is not the same. Well, you can't see that. Um, it's not the same as just, like, iterating over things in a random order. It's not, they're subtly different, right? Uh, if you just like try to iteratively pick a random item, and I'm just going to go to that, right? Every single time, then there's uh, always a chance of recurrence, right? So if you had a very naive algorithm that's just going to be like, well, you know, pick, pick an element from, you know, my five elements here, uh, and then the first time you run it, it picks A, and then the second time it picks C, and then the third time it picks D. Okay, great. Well, so far, so good. But then the fourth time, it picks C again, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's not, the, you're not traversing everything efficiently. You're going to have dupes and so on, right? And often you'll see folks actually try to build shuffling algorithms that actually do this, but then also to try to detect duplicates. So, like, if you ask uh, an inexperienced person who's never seen a shuffling algorithm uh, try to implement a shuffle, what they'll often do is, is kind of what I described, right? They'll, they'll go, okay, well, I've got five elements. Pick one at random. Uh, then try that again. But if it's the one I picked already, you know, they keep their little list down here, right? Like, uh, oh, I picked A the first time. Uh, oh, okay, next time I pick D. Next time I pick C. Great. Now I pick A. Oh, or C. But, oh, that's already in my list, right? Oh, so try again, right? And there's, there's two problems with that. Uh, one is, well, every time you're picking, you have to check it against your existing list of everything you've picked, um, which is inefficient. And then se the second inefficiency is, well, you got to throw away or re reject that attempt and try again, right? And, you know, by the time you're getting to the last element, and especially in a very long set, it's, it's very, very inefficient, right? Imagine I had like a thousand items here. Then by the time I'm trying to f figure out the 999th or 998th, item, um, uh, heavy chance I'm going to pick things that I've already selected and be like ridiculously inefficient, which is, uh, which is no good, right? So that's why a naive approach 
um, does, doesn't really work. And then another, um, and then another, so, no, so then the next kind of refinement folks often try on this is, okay, well, obviously if I just keep a sub list of things I've selected and check whether I have any duplicates, now I, I know that's inefficient, so I'm gonna be smarter, and instead I'm gonna like remove them from the first list whenever I select them, right? So I run my algorithm and the first time I pick C, great, and then I remove C from that list. And then, uh, okay, well now I can only pick from A, B, D, E. So I pick D, say, and now it's gone from the list and so on. And that looks more efficient, and it is, but it also has this dramatic downside of, well, now you have to remove things from this list and add things to that list. Uh, and removing things can often be expensive, right? Like if it's an array, you need to move things around. If it's a, a, a linked list, you gotta you know rewrite uh, links or whatnot. If it's a, a B tree, you gotta remove it from the index, like whatever, right? But it, you're you're just increasing the amount of work um, to to do. So what shuffling algorithms are about is just it trying to as much as possible, you know, take a set of elements and in one pass, like generate like a non-deterministic, like randomized reordering of those elements. Right, and there won't be any repeats or duplicates because we're uh, we're just like the word says shuffling. Right, we're just moving everything around, um, which is perfect for those applications I said earlier, <laughs> and also perfect for like you know this is what if you <laughs> if you had an old school CD player, right? It, it had a shuffle button, and it would just sh randomize the order of all the tracks of that CD, right? So. You might get track 11, and then track 7, and then track 1, and then track 5, because I guess people like being surprised by the, by the next track rather than like getting the exact order that the artist intended or whatever. Um, but it wasn't like they weren't picking a different track every single time. It was like a one-time operation that reordered uh, the entire um, thing. So um, there's lots of different shuffling algorithms, but the, the kind of standard one uh, and the one we're going to cover today is the Fisher Yates, uh, which I'm going to show you now in a second. So we'll go over to Code View, um, which uh, all right. So I got. So tell me, hopefully that's big enough to read. Um, um, but uh, I've done this in Python just because it's the simplest. Um, language that I think is the closest to pseudocode uh, for stuff like this, but we'll walk through it. So we're uh, we're importing the random module, right? That's the very first line of code um, because we're going to need something that can pick random numbers, right? And we'll 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 get to that in a minute. And then um, just to have a source of things to shuffle, I'm actually loading um, the Unix dictionary, right? So that's a file, user shared dict words. Uh, if you want to look at that file, just so that we, we're all on the same page here. Um, da, da, da. Um, that is basically every word, um, you know, from A to Z in order <laughs> in a big file, right? And it's uh, the purpose of that. It's actually <laughs> the user shared dict words is a bit of an unusual file. It's like a standard Unix file that like pretty much every distro or has, or I'm on a Mac here, um, and it, it has it too. Um, and it's, it's not really a dictionary, right? It's not telling me the definition of any of those words. Um, it's mostly used by legacy um, editors and so on to check whether a word is, exists or not. So for like very naive spell checkers that basically just check, well, is this word even real? Uh, that that's kind of what it was used for. It's not any good at that. Like a big long list of just like <laughs> words is not an efficient representation that like a spell checker would ever use. So like modern systems don't actually use it. They use if they use anything on Unix, it might be like I spell or something like that. But it's still a cool file to have around and, and useful for all sorts of things. And if you ever want to cheat at anagrams or crosswords, it's a nice little uh, source of words. Um, so we load, we open it as, as a file, right? So, uh, and we're calling that file handle dictionary, uh, which is a terrible variable name in Python, considering Python has a, <laughs> a data type, <laughs> which are called dictionaries or dicts. Um, and then we're, um, and then we're gonna uh, read all the lines in that file, just 
zoom them into memory. Uh, Python will do the line parsing for us with this read lines function. And that then goes into this uh, words um, array. And then we're going to iterate through every, um, and that, so that's just reading in words. And then we get to the actual Fisher Yates part. Uh, and we're going to go through basically for, for every single word in that file, right? From, f so we're going to go for i in like 0 to all the way until um, the, the length of that, um, the length of that list. Um, we're going to pick a random number, right? And that random number is j. <laughs> and then we're going to say, OK, well, j is a random number between 0 and the full size of the words. Don't worry, we're going to step through all this on paper in a bit. Uh, and we're just going to swap the position of i and j. That's it. That's all we're doing, right? So in one pass, uh, we're going to actually shuffle this thing. And it's counterintuitive, at least to me, that this works. <laughs> like, the first time I looked at this, I'm like, this has got to have all sorts of problems. How does this really result in a fair, uh, truly random order of things? You know, I, I'd seen other shuffling techniques. Uh, like, a common one is to use, like, quicksort or a quicksort function, but with a, a comparator that just returns a random comparison of, like, this word is is less than or greater than this other word. And that'll give you a shuffle, but it takes more time. It can take n squared time if we're doing big O notation. This one is n, right? Just this is the whole thing in, in one pass. And I'm like, how does this really work? If we're just swapping things, well, isn't there some chance I might swap them back and so on, right? And so uh, if we look at what's happening, if we go back to paper, let me rip out a sheet. Um, it's pretty cool, right? So let's say we've got our, our um, elements again, like A, B, C, D, E, F this time. We'll, we'll just go all the way to F. And, um, and we're going to shuffle those, right? So it's gonna, it's, the algorithm is going to iterate over all of these words, and it's just going to try to randomly swap them, right? And we'll see, we'll see what we think the probabilities end up being, right? So it's going to start with. It's going to start with A, right? So it's going to, it's going to be iterating, and it's the first one it hits is obviously going to be A. And it's going to pick uh, a random number between, um, let's say we're zero indexing here. So this is position 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's going to pick a, a number between 0 and 5 um, inclusive. So let's say it picks 4, right? And um, OK, it picked 4. So now we're going to swap. Uh, a and the thing that was at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, which is E, right? So now this list is going to become E, um, B, C, D, A, F, right? And so that's, that's what happens on round one. And then round two, same thing's going to happen, but it's starting at B this time. So it's definitely going to swap B, right? Um, and let's say when we run it for B, it's going to go and pick a random number. And let's say, I should have brought my dice. Uh, and let's say it's going to be um, 3, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's going to swap B and D, right? So we're going to get E, D, C, B, A, F, right? Um, and um, Maybe you can start to see how this works and is actually fair, right? Um, but I'll, I'll do an example in the next one that really makes it clear. So let's. So next round we start. We're gonna swap C, right? Because uh, we're we're starting on position C. And let's say it picks um, zero, one, two, three, four. Let's say it picks um, one, right? So if in that case it'll pick. D and it'll swap the position of C and D, and then this will become A F. And that the observation that it can actually pick something that's like earlier than C, and there's also a one in six chance that it can pick C itself. So C can actually stay exactly where it is. There's a one in six chance every single time, right, that the element will pick is just going to stay exactly where it was because we'll just try to swap it with itself. Um, kind of starts to see how all these cumulative probabilities kind of even out, right? It's like, even though we're going 
even though we're going through this thing in order, because we have at every single chat, every single kind of node, we've got, you know, equal probability of going left or right, or, um, well, actually, sorry, we've got two and six probability of going left, <laughs> three and six probability of going to the right, and one and six probability of staying exactly where we are. And because we effectively do that six times, like one for every single um, node in the list, it's going to even out, right? Every single element is going to have been visited enough times um, with all of those kind of equal likelihood, uh, likelihoods of outcomes on the probability tree that everything ends up having a fair shot of being ending up in any given position. Um, and, and it just kind of all works out. And uh, we'll see in a second uh, when we start going through reservoir samples <laughs> how the same kind of approach works out there too. And you'll, you'll start to build more of an intuition for it. But um, it's kind of mind blowing, to me at least, that like this super, super simple algorithm, right? Where we're just going through a list of words in order and then picking a random number each time and then like, well, we'll just swap the two things no matter what. Um, gets you a list that is uh, random in order. And let's let's prove it. I should run this thing. Um, <laughs> so this is going to print out all the words. Uh, and I think there's like 250,000 words in that file. So, um, so that one. Oh, so we got a bug. I knew I left a bug in it. Um, so you can see last element is always staying the same. Or at least it was that time. No, there we go. And uh, I'm pretty sure that's because I got the range wrong here. Dun, dun, dun. Um, I always forget. Yeah, there we go. I always forget whether um, Python's ranges are inclusive or exclusive and whether how they relate to lengths. And even though I've been writing in Python for probably 20 years at this point, I still forget, <laughs> like every time. Uh, so that's why we run things and test them. But you can see, right, this is clearly coming out in a different order, uh, like every single time. So we're not um, writing the most rigorous test. Uh, it can be really hard to test um, functions that um, have random outputs, um, for what it's worth. <laughs> and um, you know, I like to resort to tricks like, well, just focus on one word and then see where it ends up in the list and then um, confirm that that's in a truly random position. So maybe, uh, um, it, let's do that. How do we do that? What's the easiest way? Um, so let's, let's just print out every word and its position. Forward, inwards. Uh, well, that's not going to do because, well, we'll do it in, we'll do it in Unix rather than Python. So, um, so that's going to print out every, uh, word on, a, on its own line. Um, so we're going to give the lines numbers. So we do that by using cat dash n. <laughs> so now every line's number. It doesn't matter that we've got spaces. We just need to look for uniqueness. So let's, let's pick that word that was, uh, right at the end unboastful, right? And we're going to see what line number it ends up on uh, a few times, right? Uh, oh, wow. Well, there's, there's two words. There's the adverb, too. All right. So we just run it there, and it got, you know, position 300,000 and 18,149. Run it again. We got a very different position. Run again, we get a very different position, and so on, right? And if I ran this a few thousand times, hopefully it should be pretty uh, representative and go all over the place. But it definitely, definitely looks random to me. So that's a that's a quick check. Anyway, so that's shuffling. Um, another place uh, I use shuffling, by the way, is. Um, Sometimes it's useful to do deterministic shuffles, and is actually part of how um, shuffle sharding works. 
All right, so we're gonna open Reservoir something now. I'm just gonna close. Oh my god, my terminal session is super super slow with uh, Twitch running. All right, so Reservoir sampling. I'm gonna go back to paper. Would property best based testing be a good method here? Um, not for telling you whether something's random or not. You know, for, for randomness, um, you really, you just have to do a lot of tests. Uh, and you, you have to run things many, many times and check them. You know, like even if you're doing something simple, like uh, you want to check that a random number generator is fair, like often you have to write what are called these like mono bit tests that are basically like, well, pick a single bit somewhere in the stream and then run it a million times and check that there's close to 50-50 probability for that bit to be set, you know? But you still have to just go run it a million times and that's not something property testing can get you at. All right, so reservoir sampling. Uh, one of the hardest parts about reservoir sampling is uh, consistently spelling the word reservoir. Um, hopefully I got it right. Um, so uh, I used to teach statistics. <laughs> I had uh, when I when, when I was uh, at college one of the, one of the ways I made a little money was uh, to teach statistics to um, medical and and um, biomedical students, future doctors, you know, and um, most of them hated it. <laughs> you know, they did not go to med school to <laughs> to learn statistics, um, and uh, and I can't can't blame them, but um, you know our goal. The main goal of the course that we w were teaching them was, uh, you know, we wanted them to be able to understand a medical paper um, and to be able to read the, the statistical analysis of a something like a randomized control trial and understand whether it was rigorous or not or look for, look for signs of, <laughs> of dodginess and so on so that they could trust medical research and so on. Because that is a skill you kind of want every doctor to have, right? To be able to, to look at papers and look a bit at the statistical tables that are in those papers and have a quick sense of, wow, that, that paper really showed some very impressive results. Or a sense of, hey, there's some dodgy signs about that paper. That doesn't look right to me. Or the, or the, the power doesn't look great. And, um, and sampling and using samples are just an unbelievably um, foundational part of, of statistics and statistical analysis. And, you know, often we have uh, data sets that are just vastly too large uh, to process in, you know, the entire data set. Um, and so we want to take a, a, a representative sample from that data set and do things with it, right? Like f do some interesting crunching on it, like what's the average, what's the median, all this kind of stuff. or, or do some histograms or, or plot a data set or uh, also too it doesn't have to be numerical right like you might have a system that generates you know a million two million three million log entries like every minute right because it's a busy system and yeah you could try to keep all of those log lines around and process them all but um, that's that can be very expensive it can be very scary too, because then then your kind of analytic system or your processing system will slow down when the system gets more load. You know, when you go from three million to four million requests, uh, if your sample it also just goes from three to four million requests, well now your whole um, analytics pipeline might slow down, right? And that's not a good thing. Um, and so, being able to, to to sample helps. Now, most people when they think of sampling. They think of uh, other kinds of sampling, uh, like picking a percentage of things, right? So it's like, okay, well, I can't process all 1 million requests, so I'm just gonna start sampling. I'm gonna only keep 1 million, or sorry, 50% of my uh, log entries, say, right? And so for every request, I'm gonna flip a coin, and if it comes up heads, I'm gonna keep it, and if it comes up tails, I'm gonna throw it away, right? And that is a kind of sampling. But um, not to be too opinionated, but as a 
you know, someone with a bit of a statistics background and a bit of an operational background uh, where I work now too, I think it's idiotic and ridiculously stupid. And I really wish people would not go to that as a default technique. <laughs> okay, I clearly failed at not being opinionated. But, um, and, the, and the reasons are kind of twofold. One is that operational reason I just went into, which is if you, if you sample based on a percentage, right, uh, you're still prone to overload. Right? If the system load still goes from like two to three to four million requests, when even with a 50% sample, then uh, you're still gonna get an increase in the amount of data that goes out, right? And your analytic system and your data processing pipeline is still gonna have to scale dynamically or slow down, right? And that's, that's not good. Um, and then the second reason is just in statistics, the, st the statistical power of a sample is has nothing to do with the sampling rate. That's like a core foundational principle of statistics. But if you, and a good example of that is like, I'm from Ireland, right? Which is a country with a population of like close to 5 million people, right? But I live in the US, which is a country with a much, much larger population, I think over 300 million, right? Now, if I ran a survey in Ireland and I polled 1,000 people, right? Just asking them a question, what's your favorite sandwich? I don't know, whatever, right? Um, and then I, and then I ran a, the same survey in the U.S. and I also polled one thousand people, right, and asked them what their favorite sandwich is. Those two surveys, right? Um, as long as they're as long as they're polling a representative, fair sample of the population, have equal statistical power. The power comes from the thousand, right? Not from the rate. Right, so the fact my sampling rate in Ireland would be much, much higher than in the US, 60 times higher, right? Like it would be um, much, 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 much higher in Ireland because a thousand people out of five million is a much, much higher percentage than a thousand people out of 300 plus million. But it doesn't matter. That's not how statistics works, right? And that's not how sampling works. Uh, the, the, the statistical power of a sample or a data set is based only on the sample size. So when you see rate-based sampling, like to a lot of trained st statisticians, that's like a sign that like, okay, those people just d <laughs> like don't know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like you're missing, you, mi you missed the first week of, uh, <laughs> of Stats 101, you know? <laughs> and, and, it's, and, um, and then also on the operational side, you know, people eventually often realize those pr operational problems of, well, like more load in means more load out. Uh, and they build adaptive sampling systems. So they go, oh my God, we're getting too much right now. We're good, you know, <laughs> uh, we have to go from 50% sampling to 40% sampling to 20% sampling, you know, and they build these little control planes that kind of react and adjust the sampling rate dynamically, right? Uh, to tune it and keep fewer and fewer samples as we go, right? Um, this is all unnecessary and kind of dumb because <laughs> there exists a technique called reservoir sampling. And the idea with reservoir sampling, right, like the name suggests, you've got a river, uh, and it flows into a reservoir, and it flows out again, and the like flow rate of the river has no impact on the size of the reservoir, <laughs> right? Like. Yeah, you might get more water in and you'll get more water out, but the reservoir stays the same size, right? And in reservoir sampling, it's just this really cool technique where even without knowing the flow rate of the stream or the final size of the stream, uh, we can decide in advance, look, we just want to keep 1,000 representative samples um, and we want it to be fair and we want every sample to have an equal shot to make it in that reservoir. Um, um, so give it to me. Right? And reservoir sampling can do this. It's magic. It's really, really cool. And it doesn't need to know it doesn't need to know, well, I'm gonna have a million requests and I want my sample to be a thousand, so I have to do one in a thousand. It doesn't need to know that in advance. It will like, dynamically self balance. Uh, and we're gonna see how. And it uses techniques very similar to the uh, Fisher Fisher Yates shuffle which we covered. So I'm gonna go back to code and we're gonna go look uh, at a reservoir sampling algorithm. Um, so here again, we're starting by importing the, the words file, the Unix words file. Um, I'm using a little Python trick here, which is to create an empty array 
of strings, of 100 strings. So just this notation, um, if you don't know Python, it, it can be a little confusing. But this is a this is a one sized array effectively of an empty string or a string with a space in it. Um, and it, Python, if you multiply that by 100, will actually create a 100 sized array with the same thing in it. It's just this neat shortcut if you want to populate um, if you want to populate arrays. Um, and this is going to be our sample. So we're starting it off empty. We're, we want a sample of size 100, and we're just starting it off completely empty. Uh, and we start off with a count of zero, right? Um, that effectively have no elements in it. And then here we're going to model a stream. So we're using a for loop here, and we know how many words we have up front because we process them. But this algorithm actually works even if we don't know the final count. And that's important because that makes this a streaming algorithm, right? This is the kind of thing we can run on like logs in real time. And so you might make it a time-based algorithm. You might say like every minute we're going to you know, we're going to start a new sample, and we want uh, a representative sample of, of 1,000 requests from the next minute, right? And at the end of the minute, we're going to cut it off, and whatever made it into the reservoir made it into the reservoir. That's kind of how it works. But it didn't know in advance how many requests there would be in that minute. So we're kind of modeling that here with the, the word, word count. But um, basically what we do, it's uh, incredibly simple, <laughs> is we pick a random number, which here is J, between um, zero and the total number of words we've seen so far, right? So let's count, right? And if that random number is smaller than the size of our sample set, well then we put that um, element in the sample set at that position. That's it. Unbelievable, probably one of the simplest algorithms I've ever seen. And this will actually work out to being a fair reservoir sample, and we're going to see how, right? And we're first going to run it <laughs> and kind of prove it to ourselves. But so if I, oh my god, this is slow again. Um, so that is 100 random words from the words file. There we go again, a different 100 random words, and like, can just go at this all day. It'll just always give me 100 random words. Uh, every word had a fair shot of making it in. Um, the order itself uh, is also a little random. We'll see how in a second. Uh, although it's not shuffled, and we'll see a little important difference uh, uh, about that later. Um, but you know, if we look at the code, no, I don't have that open. Um, you know, there's nothing in this loop that knew how many words there were at the beginning. And yet we produced uh, a fair sample. So here's how, right? So we're going to walk through it. So let's say, so we're going to need a, a few more elements, um, a few more elements this time for, uh, to, to work through an example. Um, so, Let's say we're going to use 16, I think. You see that? That's A. So B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, J, L, M. 13, 14, 15, 16, is that right? 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. All right. Hopefully, I'm going to raise my camera here. Um, so let's say this is the stream of elements. They're going to gonna come in. Ah, sorry. There we go. Um, so let's say this is the stream of elements that are going to come in. Um, and we want to pick a representative sample of, let's make it easy, eight, right? So every single letter will have had a 50-50 chance of making it into the reservoir, right? But the algorithm itself, importantly, didn't know there would be 16 elements, right? So we just start off a reservoir and we've got eight elements, right? And uh, I think here I'm going to actually need a... <laughs> 
uh, a real random number generator. So I'm going to code one up and we'll uh, switch back and forth um, to my... Uh, well, I'll show you the code screen while I'm coding just to be no tricks up my sleeve. Um, so let's just make sure this works. All right. So let's go back. Um, all right, so the first one we get to A, right? And um, what we do is for A, we pick a random number between 0 and 1, <laughs> uh, or actually between 1 and 1, uh, because the rule is uh, you know, pick a random number between 0 and the total number you've seen so far, right? So we pick 1, and at that point, um, it goes into this, you know, it has to go into the sample, right? At that point, um, one um, is uh, definitely a position in the sample, right? It's, it's smaller than the, the total sample size, so it goes in, right? So it makes it into our sample. And then the same will be true for B, right? When we pick, when we uh, go to B, it'll be, um, So that's, you know, it'll be 0 or 1, and it picked 1, show you that. And so it ends up at position 1. All right, one second. Um, the, uh, I want to make sure I'm getting this right. And we do this, like, we can actually skip all of this for the first, like, eight elements, effectively, right? We don't need to worry about the random numbers for the first eight. Because we can go, well, for every single one of those, uh, we know it'll make it into the sample, in order. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's the sample at that point after just iterating for the first eight letters, right? So we got this far in the stream, and we said, OK, well, there's space for these in the sample, so they just make it in in order no matter what. If we didn't have, like if we had fewer than eight elements in the stream, we just wouldn't, like, we'd stop here, right? We'd have a 100% sampling rate because they'd just all make it into our reservoir. Pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and if we have exactly eight elements, we'll still have a 100% sampling rate. It's only when we start having more elements that we have to start thinking about replacing things. I actually should have had that in my code. I think it was a bug in my code. I was, I was not coding for the case where it can be less than all the elements. Uh, <laughs> but um, you should in a proper implementation. But it's, it's, it's pretty easy to have that rule. Look, if you're in the first eight elements, or the first less than sample size elements, don't even bother rolling a dice. You don't need to worry about random numbers. Just put them right in, right? Um, and then after this, right, so when we get to the, like, this element, the ninth element, right, so we haven't seen this yet. It needs to have, right, um, a fair chance to get in here, right? So what's a fair chance for i, right? A fair chance for i, well, there's nine elements in total, and there's eight spaces. So eight, a every element needs to have an 8 over 9 <laughs> chance of ending up in this sample, right? And so if we go back to our code, um, if we you know, run a random number, generate a random number for this, it's probably almost certainly going to be uh, less than 8. There we go. It um, ends up being uh, 4 in this case. Right? So this one becomes A, B, C, D. Uh, what was it? I. F, G, H. Um, and then you can kind of extend this logic. Same would be true for J, except now J, right, has to have an 8 in 10 chance of going in, right? Well, it's kind of obvious that this is going to be true for J, 
right? Like if you look at the code, um, go back to the code view. Um, because we'll only, you know, we'll we'll add j in this case if the count, um, you know, the count will be ten at that point, and we'll be saying, well, okay, well, if you picked a random number between uh, one and ten that's less than eight, then you go in, right? So it has an eight and ten chance of making it in, right? That's just gonna, that's it's pretty easy to see how it's true for j. And then you can extend that. It's very easy to see how that's true for K, L, M, N, O, P. By the way, you get to P. By the time you get all the way to P, it's like, um, you know, you've got a, you've, the count will be 16. Uh, a fair sh chance of entry is that it has a, an, you know, an 8 over um, 16 chance of making it in, right? And that's just how the math's going to work out and it's going to go in, right? The hard part and the bit that's slightly less intuitive. <laughs> right is but what what says that there's like you know it feels like there's a bias towards these early dudes that made it in you know like the first eight that definitely go in like a b c d e f g h like they're just gonna <laughs> you know <laughs> they got a spot automatically they didn't have to go through this dice rolling right they didn't have to do the the eight to um eight to ten uh eight out of ten or the eight out of sixteen chance of making it in but the thing is, like from their point of view, every single new element is like an extra chance that they could be replaced, right? So like if you think about this A dude, like when we stopped here, when, when, when we let the first eight elements in, right? Like they all had a you know, perfect shot of getting in. If you look at the next round, when we think about this I dude, well he's got an eight out of 10 chance, he's definitely gonna go in here, right? And then out of that, he's got a one in eight chance of ending up in any of these given spots, right? So A here, <laughs> from his perspective, he's like, well, I've got a, an eight over nine times a one over eight chance that I'm gonna be evicted, right? And I is gonna replace me. And if you do the math, you work that out, like it all ends up being self-balancing, self right? And then next is true for J and K and so on. And this all adds up cumulatively. And it's just nice and self-balancing. Um, and there's a way to look at this, that what's really going on, right, is that you're actually doing the same stuff we were doing before with Fisher Yates. You're doing this gigantic kind of potential swapping or shuffling over this like inf potentially infinite stream or series. And what you're seeing is just like a slice of the shuffle. Like you're just seeing like the bottom slice of the, the potential reshuffling of all of these things, right? And in real time, and then you get left with what you're left. And it's really, really, really awesome. And um, so, like I said, if we go back to the code, um, like it's just an unbelievably simple algorithm. Like we're talking about two or three lines here, um, and yet it self-balances like this and achieves what you want, right? And just gives you this great, um, property. So we've built, you know, metrics and analytics systems like this at AWS where, you know, you've got a system, you want to have some observability on it, but you don't necessarily need to be able to trace every single entry. So you keep a reservoir sample, right, of log entries from, from every single um, place. And at any point you can go, well, give me a snapshot of like a thousand requests that represent that minute in time, right? and you can do whatever analytics you want on it and ask whatever questions you have. Uh, Google had a system and a paper uh, a long time ago published uh, called Sawzall, which I don't think they use anymore. Maybe, maybe they've replaced with a, a, a more modern alternative. Built on reservoir sampling, you know, it was this cool system for pushing, collecting and pushing reservoirs around and then being able to ask the system dynamic questions on those reservoirs. And what I really love about those systems is the liveness properties, right? Because, because the size of the reservoir, like the size of the output, is always going to be fixed. Uh, you can know that the, the system that's analyzing that reservoir will have the same performance no matter what. So even if the system gets super busy with load, um, your ability to get insights into that system uh, you know, stays predictable, which is nice. It doesn't just get slow, like uh, sampling rates or adaptive sampling rates. Uh, can, um, which suck. Um, yeah, so I don't know what else to say about um, 
uh, reservoir samples, except that maybe, um, I think something I'll try to cover a few more examples of in later uh, Twitch streams are um, this concept of streaming algorithms in general uh, is like super worth its own kind of deep dive. There's a whole lot of algorithms that are designed to work on unpredictably sized data sets. You know, and some examples I can think of, right? Like, so there's, there's algorithms for finding the percentiles of a stream, like P squared is a good one if you want to Google it. That's, it uh, you'll learn a lot if you understand how P squared works, right? Which can, fi can find percentiles on an unbounded stream of data, which is pretty impressive. Or uh, sketch algorithms, things like hyperlog logs, right? That can uh, tell you the cardinality of a stream, right? They can tell you how many unique elements there are in a stream. Without having to pr without having to just keep the whole stream in memory, or process the whole thing, and um, and algorithms like that that can like operate on a stream on a one by one basis, um, you know, without needing to to just store the whole thing in memory or sort it or anything like that, like they're just worth their weight in gold. They tend to end up being super super valuable in in live online systems and something we end up using a lot of. Um, but that was everything I had. Um, as usual, I'll go through the questions on Twitch and see if there was any I didn't get to and, and answer them. If so there's any more, now's a good time to get them in. Um, this, this stream, I'll put it on YouTube like, like the others. I haven't done the last two weeks yet. I uh, just haven't had time to splice things together yet in a video editor. Um, but I will. Uh, they're, they're, I'm not going to let them age out. And uh, whoever asked me last time to start tagging these streams, uh, I have started doing that, and if people have additional tag suggestions, uh, let me know. All right, I'm just going to go through the... We don't have too many questions today, so that's a good sign. Um, oh, so the first comment is that the uh, is about the math problem. Do I still have that here? About the, uh, the logic being that it should look like it should be greater than a fourth. I think... Yeah, straight away when you look at this math problem, it should be pretty obvious the answer has got to be more than a quarter. But I can also totally understand why people would be tricked into, like, if they had to give a very quick answer, like, tell me the first thing in your head, they might say a quarter just because they, like, see a quarter, right? Um, and then someone says their 12-year-old answered a third right away and had the exact same graphical reasoning. I, I bet a lot of kids would get this right away using that graphical technique. Right, that they've learned to do because um, they've learned to do graphical proofs, and we have forgotten, <laughs> which is kind uh, kind of kind of crazy, kind of cool. Um, also, if you read about like um, Feynman, Richard Feynman, he had a lot of little tips and tricks for um, how to very quickly develop intuition about problems like this and all sorts of other mathematical problems to exclude uh, potential answers and and zoom in on what might be the right thing uh, correctly. I already asked the question, answered the question about property-based testing. Um, Jeff asks, is it possible for a sample not to be completely filled with reservoir sampling? It is absolutely possible. If you have fewer than this number of elements, then yeah, you won't fill the sample. It'll, you'll, you'll get 100% of everything because you, you set out with a sampling size um, that, that was bigger. And then you didn't miss the bit where the sampling gets filled from the stream and then are replaced. I screwed up. I made a mistake, and then we fixed it. So that was, that was on me. Um, and yeah, the Ken has an accurate description of what's going on. Makes sense. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to cover next week. The, the topic I had put on Twitter was um, potentially on, on um, how we do uh, functional programming, <laughs> or at least use functional programming techniques. Uh, in C, um, uh, and I'm I'm not confident it's going to be an interesting enough topic for people. So if people think any different, let me know. Uh, but I guess it's about trying trying to develop higher order ways of thinking about code and organizing them, and then applying it to a very non-functional language just to show that it can be done. But anyway, that's everything I have for now. Um, thanks for watching. <laughs>